Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Yesterday, SpaceX launched the biggest rocket ever. It didn't go to space, but it did dig deeper than most other rockets do. Yeah, we've been anticipating the debut launch of Starship for over a year, and we knew that once the countdown hit zero, excitement was guaranteed. We just didn't know exactly what form that excitement would take. For reference, this is my authentic reaction to watching this event yesterday. It's moving! Holy shit balls, it's going! <laughs> I did not expect that. <laughs> So I had been at a pretty amazing event for the last few days, but it wasn't spectacular in the same way that the largest rocket ever exploding over the Gulf of Mexico could be. So while we as observers on the sidelines got to take in the launch, ascent, and eventual breakup of this massive piece of work, the people actually working on it, they presumably came away with a metric crap ton of telemetry and data that they can hopefully analyze to make things better next time. And I think the first thing that they're going to need to have a look at is stage zero. So stage zero holds the rocket vertical, it fuels it, in theory it will ultimately catch it. But in its current form they have had issues with the concrete underneath the engines basically breaking under the force. It's common for launch systems to include flame diverters or water suppression systems to protect the rocket and the launch infrastructure. But the thing is, if you are trying to build a rocket which could, say, land on Mars and take off from Mars, you may not have that option. And SpaceX had been, well, aspirationally trying to avoid doing this. It did indeed turn out to be a mistake. So this is one of the early photographs by La Padre showing a fairly substantial crater. But this image from an aircraft owner, this really tells a story. You can see that on one side, the reinforced concrete has had the concrete stripped away, leaving the rebar behind. You can see there's water, by the way, already come floating in there. And this is a big problem with Boca Chica. The water table is so close to the surface, they can't really dig down. Now, they could start building it up, but then they would have to work with the Army Corps of Engineers, and of course, they've already built this giant tower. This is a big problem. All that missing dirt and concrete, that had to go somewhere. A lot of it was just thrown up into the air. Look at the debris coming out of the bottom of the rocket during this initial part of the launch. A big component of that cloud is dust and sand and pulverized concrete being kicked up by those engines. And it blew with the winds over uh, South Padre Island and a bunch of people had uh, you know, clean off their cars. But the bigger flying chunks damaged ground equipment, including the tank farm, but more importantly, some of that stuff must have hit the rocket. The vehicle took off missing engines right away. So I think the clock was actually kind of wrong because they were supposed to start ignition at T minus six seconds and then at T zero would be takeoff, but it was more like T minus two and then T plus four when I saw first movement. Now, a lot of people initially saw it leaning over and uh, as if it was about to fall. I think that is a pad avoidance maneuver, which makes total sense if you've got that amount of propellant in there. You want it to make sure that if something goes wrong, it doesn't fall back down. Now, the next thing to look at is their telemetry. In the bottom left, they actually show which engines are active. And if you look at the outer ring of uh, fixed booster engines, the two in that ring that have failed are next to each other. And that means that it's much more likely they failed due to a common cause, say of a chunk of concrete impacting both of them. That being said, we begin to see progressive engine failures over the launch, sometimes by uh, quite visible flashes. Now this one, this particular failure actually looks to be potentially more interesting than the others. Because this is actually sitting ahead of the engines and it looks like it might be part of the fairing that covers things like the hydraulic power unit. And the hydraulic power unit is pretty important because it generates pressure in the hydraulic system that is used to drive the thrust vectoring and other mechanical parts of the rocket. Less relevant is the people posting images from this section of the flight showing the rocket looking a little bent. I think this is entirely due to rolling shutter on the camera that they were using. The vehicle is fine and straight. The other thing I'm seeing is a lot of very bright engine flames that's consistent with uh, engine rich exhaust. I think a bunch of these engines are uh, failing in some way and they're slowly shutting down as these failures destroy the internals. You might think that Starship with uh, so many engines should be able to handle the loss of an engine or two. With 33 engines, each engine is like 3% of the total thrust. And that's, you know, not that bad, especially when you consider that the vehicle had no payload. It's not quite that simple because what you're actually interested in is the excess acceleration over the force of gravity. So each engine accounts for more like 9% of the performance. 
and this lack of thrust is enough to affect the trajectory. So the vehicle, first of all, it hits max Q later than it was supposed to. But also as it hits this point in the atmosphere when it's starting to generate a vapor trail, you'll notice that it's actually kind of going slightly at an angle to the airflow. I believe the vehicle is too low in its trajectory and it's trying to lift itself up to get back on its planned flight plan. Or it might just be having trouble controlling itself, which is a big problem because the rocket is aerodynamically unstable. With all those aerodynamic devices on the front of the rocket, the center of lift is in front of the center of mass. And that means that without control, it would want to flip around. So it needs to have the engine gimballing to keep the rocket pointing straight. So I think it's around this time that the vehicle is starting to pitch around in a manner that the engines cannot control it. And whether this is because they've lost hydraulic pressure or it's simply gone too far outside of its uh, angle of attack envelope, uh, yeah, the vehicle begins this pitch around. And it is worth mentioning that there is a planned pitch maneuver during the separation sequence that the uh, presenters talk about, but that's not what this is. This is a loss of control. And you'll see the angle of attack display has actually flipped through 180 degrees because the vehicle is really just spinning around. Do note that the view inside the uh, interstage showing the engine shows that the structure of the rocket is actually in pretty good shape. It hasn't bent. And since it's no longer able to accelerate, the uh, vehicle more or less is sort of cruising upwards towards its apex. Its peak speed was about 2150 kilometers per hour and it will hit out at an apex or an apogee of about 39 kilometers, which is a long way below their planned separation altitude. Now, the presenters did talk about the stage separation happening. I don't think that was ever commanded because a prerequisite for stage separation is shutting down the engines on the main stage so that they are actually, they're not pushing the spacecraft together. That doesn't happen. Instead, the vehicle begins to fall back to earth. And as it's falling back, it's accelerating, the atmosphere is getting denser, it's going to hit the second max Q event. And at that point, I think that actually causes a structural failure in the rocket. So we do have confirmation from the FAA, the flight termination system was activated, but I think the, re the vehicle was failing before that point, because first of all, we have a potential leak of a image showing a camera on the Starship fin showing a bent structure. And just the physics of the situation makes sense. We've got most, most of the fuel is now remaining in the Starship, which hasn't burned any. The rest of the tanks are empty and everything experiences aerodynamic drag, more or less the same. So you've got this sort of point where you've got most of the mass concentrated and the vehicle is going to be bending around this location. And that's roughly where the bend appears to be in that leaked image. So I think Starship makes this one final rotation edge on into the airstream. It's at 31 kilometers now, it's fast again, and the booster tanks fail, and then Starship has its flight termination system activated. And then debris rains down over the Gulf of Mexico. The camera views do show the uh, explosion starts down at the base of the rocket, which could actually be a flight termination system activation but it does appear to show that it is slightly not straight anymore. Again, really hard to see, uh, and I'm sure SpaceX have the data, and I'm sure they're excited to look over this data and maybe get to fixing some of the problems, but yeah, it does look like stage zero is gonna be the main focus of attention. We can actually figure out roughly where the vehicle was when it broke up, thanks to uh, the flash of the explosion, which showed up on the lightning detector of uh, GOES East, which is a geostationary sat weather satellite. This also picked out the plume on ascent and the shadow that it cast in the early morning sun. The plume and the debris cloud that was generated also showed up on a weather radar. And of course, all this actually helps us potentially locate where the debris might actually end up. So the light stuff will tend to fall straight down, the heavier stuff will continue further out to sea. So if we overlay the weather data uh, with a marine map, we see that the water there is about 150 feet deep. So basically, don't try going there if you're an amateur scuba diver. This is well in the range of technical diving. It is possible, but experts only. And remember, just because that piece of hardware is on the ocean floor doesn't mean that it's not ITAR. So yeah, to everyone at SpaceX that worked on this, uh, I hope you're feeling good because you get a lot of work to do. 
I can't tell you when the next launch is going to be. While they have got boosters and starships lined up for tests 2 and 3, it's very clear that stage 0 is going to need some serious civil engineering to solve the problems. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>